information will be amazing. <coughs> All right, so let's talk about um, what we want to do is give two names for the plane that contains line M and line P. So you can see M right here and P right there. Those are our lines. And the reason they're lines and not points is because they are not capitalized. You can see they are lowercase letters. So that means that those are talking about the lines P and M. But what we want is we want the plane. And when you name a plane, you could draw, if you want, just a rectangle, or you could write the word plane. Either way is going to work. And when we do that, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look for dots on our plane, on our sheet of paper. So when we do this, we're talking about this sheet of paper right here. We want three points on this sheet of paper that are not in a straight line, because if they're in a straight line, we don't know if they're in a plane or if they're a line. So if we take three points that are not in a straight line, like A, B, excuse me, D, um, we could label this as plain ABD. We could also just use the, the letter in the corner and call it plain Q, but I kind of want to focus on this right here as well because this point E is on our sheet of paper. Now, underneath, like it's, like it's going directly through the paper, so um, E is going to be on our sheet of paper, but F and G are not. So we could actually do like A, E, and B. And those three are not in a straight line either. Um, so just making sure that we can label that, okay? Next, we want to, the question's asking us, give two, give two names for lines containing A. So let's highlight our A, it's right here. And what we're doing is we're looking for a way to do that. Well, we could say, line M because line M refers to that however I think what is more commonly known is giving us two points in that line so we could talk about A and B um, those two points make up our line or we could talk about A and C now we don't have to talk about what's in between them because all points are included on this and what we want to do is put a line with a double arrow over it um, to represent that that line extends forever. And, and just so that we cover all bases, we could even talk about line BC as well, because line BC does contain A, even though we're not using A in our answer. So that's okay as well. All right. Okay. Uh, name two points that are coplanar. So once again, on that same sheet of paper. So it's almost kind of going back to question one, but coplanar with D. So once again, here is our D. So we need two points that are on that same sheet of paper. So any of these dots that we talked about, you could say AB, you could say BC, you could say EB, you could say E A E C, you know, like you have multiple choices here. They're just asking for two points that are on that same sheet of paper. <clears throat> Hopefully I'm coming through okay. If anybody is on, uh, please let me know. Of course, I'm not recording. God, I can't sometimes. Okay. So it's been a minute, so I got to backtrack a little bit. So let's talk about giving two names for the plane that contains lines M and line P. And we know they're lines because they're lowercase, where the uppercase letters are our actual points in our, gra in our picture, okay? And then up here in the corner, it actually talks about plane Q. So we could talk, and another way to talk about this plane could be plane Q. Um, but most of the time when we do planes, you need three points that are not in a straight line. So we talked about ABD being one of them and AEB being another one. Because um, you have three points that are not in a straight line but are all on this green sheet of paper. 
okay? Then number two asks to give two names for the lines that contain A. So we have A here and we have our line. So we could have said line M and just left it at that. That's one that does contain A. And then we're gonna use two letters. We could do AB, we could do AC, or we could even do BC. All three of those contain our point A and still represent that line um, one way or another. Uh, number three, it said name two points that are called planar. So once again on this green sheet of paper, we want two points that are called planar with D. So now it's just picking two letters that are not in a straight line, but we couldn't do that anyways, but um, two letters that are on this plane. We did talk about E and F going through the paper. So our E, our F and G go through that paper as well. So really E is the only one on that sheet of paper. F and G are actually above and below it. So we can do A, E, B, we, or A, E, because we only need two letters. Um, we could do E, B, E, C, we could do A, B, we could do A, C. Uh, so there's a lot of combinations for take, picking two points that are called plane. Um, next, name a point where lines M and P meet. So when we look at this one, we're talking about this line right here. And then we're talking about this line right here. And where do these two lines intersect each other? We're gonna talk about this point right here. And where lines M and P meet is at the intersection point. And we're gonna put point B, or you could do point B. Either one of those are proper ways to do it. Oh, thank you so much princess for the like that's awesome really appreciate that are points a b and d collinear now vocab word that you could get stumped on is collinear however what i tell my students is what word is in the middle of collinear okay and if we look at collinear what word is in between them we have the word line so when I look at A, B, and D, are they on this, or do they create a line? So yes or no? And you are obviously going to say no, but the reason it's no is because um, you can see A, B, and D do not form a straight line. And that's what your explanation would be. Now, if they wanted us to draw, and this is what they call a ray, it has an initial point and a direction. So our ray's initial point you can see right here is B, and then we can put A anywhere. We can put it here, we can put it there, anywhere you want. Just make sure you label it A when you're done. Um, and that would be my drawing for ray AB. Excuse me, ray BA. Because you always want to start, when you talk about a ray, you want to start with the initial point and then the direction. All right, so that sets us up for the first six problems. Let's move along to the next set. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Oh, it's just a little too big. Let me try and... Um, so that's 42, then it would be 30. So we know it's a three, carry that. And then 12, that would be 35 would be my best guess. So 35 plus 17 is 45 and then 52. All right, sweet. So that gets us through problem number seven. Let me get rid of this so I can work on the next one. Okay, so same thing here. The piece plus the piece equals the whole thing. So I'm going to set up AB plus BC equals AC. So with that, we're going to put AB is 3x minus 12 plus BC, which is 2x plus 8 equals AC. And they told us AC is 60. Okay. So what I'm going to do I'm going to slide this over and try, um, 
Actually, I'll try and do this as much as I can. Give myself a little room. So, uh, I'm going to do 3x minus 12 plus 2x plus 8 equals 60. Let me check, see. Okay, everybody can see that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to underline what I'm trying to solve for. I'm trying to solve for the variables. And then I'm going to draw a line down the middle of the equal sign. Doing that separates my equation into two halves. So I know if I subtract something from one side and I do it to the other, it better be on the other side of the line. Okay. Now, if I have underlines on the same side, this is where I can combine like terms. Okay. So my like terms are going to be 3x plus 2x, which gives me 5x. That 60 is going to stay 60. And then I also can connect negative 12 plus 8, which will give me a negative 4. So what I'm doing is I'm just combining terms that I want to put together. And I can combine the 3x and the 2x. And then I can also combine the negative 12 plus the 8. Both of those I can combine as well. So when I do that and combine like terms, I end up getting 5x take away 4. Now, Go back to underlining the variable so that I know what I'm solving for. Now I have a 5x minus 4. That minus 4 is way out on the outside because when I read this, I do 5x minus 4. So I want to get rid of the minus 4 first. So the opposite or inverse operation is what we call, um, we're going to add 4 to both sides. So we're going to add 4 to both of our, our sides. Uh, what this is going to do is this is going to zero out the negative 4 and the positive 4. Because if I do 4, take away 4, that gives me 0. So that zeroes it out. And what I'm left with is my 5x equals, and then I'm going to do 60 plus 4 and get 64. So this um, is what we call the addition property of equality because we are going to do it to both sides all right so the addition property of equality and when we do that what we did is we zero out the fours okay so that was our step there now once we get here we have 5x equals 64 now we have 5 times x even though it's not written there you need to know that you multiply there so to get rid of multiplication, I'm going to do division. I'm going to divide, and we call this division property of equality because I did it to both sides of my equation. And, um, so we're going to do division property of equality. The 5 divided by 5 is going to 1 out because any number divided by itself it just becomes a 1. And then when we do 64 divided by 5, that gives us our answer. And what we did is we 1 out the 5s. Okay. All right. Now, that sets us up for the last problem. But the last problem, in doing this, we want to draw a picture. Because if you understand what, the hap what is happening in the picture, the question becomes a little bit more manageable uh, to solve. So what we have is we have a line and it's A to B because we have M is the midpoint of AB. So we have a line AB. Now in the middle of that, we have an M. It's the midpoint. And if they tell us that A to M is 2X minus 9, let me ask you this. What do you think M to B is? If M is in the middle... Wouldn't it make sense that m to b would also be 2x minus 9? Because you're splitting it in half. So half of it's going to be 2x minus 9. The other half's going to be 2x minus 9. And then they tell you the whole thing is 34. So once again, we're going to set up that equation of a piece plus a piece equals the whole thing. So we're going to do 2x minus 9 plus 2x minus 9 equals 34. Highlight your variables, draw a line down the middle of the equal sign, and now you can see once again we're going to combine like terms. 
So this is going to end up being 4x minus 18 equals 34. And then continue to solve it. So we would add 18, divide by 4, and get our solution. Okay. Uh, I don't want to go all the way through it because I want my students to actually try a little bit of this and, and see if they can do it. Um, just to give them a little bit of a challenge. All right. <clears throat> Next up. We want to find the length. Um, once again, just trying to see it on my screen to see if it fits. And oh my God, come on now, come on, come on. Stay right there. Okay, now I can click on this and shrink it just a little bit. Otherwise, people watching on their phone can't see what I'm doing. Ah. Uh, number 10 asks us about the length and the length is what we call distance and the distance we have a formula x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared and then we take the square root of the whole thing this is our distance formula and it wants to find the distance from g to h so what we need is g this ordered pair, which if we don't go right or left any, because remember an ordered pair is always going to be X comma Y. And here's my X axis. Here's my Y axis. And we just want to go, how many X's do I go to how many Y's do I go? I think, I think it's a carrot. All right. What's a carrot? <laughs> uh, welcome, M. Welcome, Rachel. So, uh, so our G is, we're not going right or left any, so we're gonna say it's zero, comma, goldfish, welcome. And then we're gonna go up one, two. So it'll be zero, two. That's gonna be our ordered pair for the first one. And then we have H, and H is way over here. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four to the right. And right is positive, left is negative. And then once again, we're going to go up again. Up is positive, where down this time will be negative. And we're going to go up one, two, three, four. So it would be four comma four. Okay? Now, when we write an ordered pair, we said it's always going to be x comma y. x comma y. Okay? So my, welcome. Um, so we're going to label them X and Y, X and Y. And then what one did I write first? I'm going to label X1, Y1. What am I going to write second? Label it X2, Y2. Don't overthink that process. That's all the ones and two stand for is which one did you write down first? Which one did you write down second? Now, if I can color coordinate this a little bit, let's see if I can do that. There's X2. Here is X1. Then I have a Y2, and then I have a Y1. And if I put those numbers in those colored spots, um, I should come up with what I'm looking for. And we're gonna do D, oh, I forgot I changed it to green. Let's go back to black. D equals the square root and we're going to have something in parentheses and we're subtracting this something and we're squaring it. And we're going to have something in this parentheses. We're subtracting it and we're going to square it. Okay. So uh, that's a pretty bad subtraction. Sign, so let's clean that up. So now let's fill in our blanks. So we know it's going to be pink and pink was four minus this aqua green and zero. Then we had y2, which is this purple, four, minus the blue, which will be two. So once we do that, we're going to get d equals four squared plus two squared. And all I did was combine like term, just do the parentheses. So four minus zero is four, four take away two is two. And then we square them. And what this is, is it's not, four times two. What it is, is we write the parentheses this many times. This could be a two, could be a three, could be a seven. 
whatever this number is up here, this small number we call an exponent, that tells us how many parentheses we have. Now, what's in our parentheses is a four. Oh, shoot, that's off screen for phone people, sorry. Let's try it again. So this right here tells us we have two parentheses. That's what I'll do. And then this one, I have two parentheses. And I'm gonna add them together, still gonna square root them, and I'll put D equals. So this little exponent tells us how many parentheses we have. What's inside of them, we put inside. What's inside of them, we put inside. And then we're just gonna multiply together. So four times four is 16, two times two is four. Keep the radical or what we call a square root, um, and simplify our answer. So now combine like terms, we're gonna get 20. And then the square root of 20, um, you could plug into a calculator. There's ways to simplify it. For my students, this is, I, I just need you to get to here for right now. Now, if you wanna put it in the calculator, let's do a little, um, there's my Desmos. Here we go, and do, let's do it this way pull this up we'll do square root and then we'll plug in 20 and you'll get 4.47 and that's the number multiplied by itself that's going to get you 20 because <clears throat> remember 4 times 4 is 16 5 times 5 is 25 so it better be between 4 and 5 okay so once again, we called it uh, 4.47. So let's put 4.47 here, okay? And once again, finding the length, this is what we call distance formula, okay? All right. So next one, we want to find the midpoint. So if we're going to look for the midpoint, and scrap all of this. And it's beneficial for me to do this, even though it's a little time consuming, because then my students just can't fast forward to the end of the video. They need to watch and see each part. All right, now we want to find the midpoint. And the midpoint is exactly what it says. We want to find a point. Remember, a point is x comma y. We talked about that. This is a point. Okay? And the point we're looking for is what is directly in the middle between E and F. Sorry, I had to see the F right here. Here's our F right here. Here's our E, F. And what we're looking for is the point in between those, okay? So that better be an X comma Y. However, there's a little bit of things that we need to do. We need to take the first point, add it to the second point, and then divide by two. And then do the same thing for the Y values and divide by two. If we do that, then we're going to actually get the midpoint. Very welcome. So our first point is going to be E, we should have an order pair. And then our second point is going to be F. And remember, it's got to be X comma Y. X comma Y. M, welcome. Alexis, welcome. Um, so E, if we look at this, remember our X value comes first. And we had to jump from zero. We got to go one, two, three, four backwards. So that's what we call a negative four. And then from there, we got to go down one, two, three. So that's a negative three. For F, we don't have to jump as far. We only have to jump one to the left. But remember, left is negative. And then down is negative as well. But we only have to do that once as well. Okay? So here are our two ordered pairs. What one did we write first? That's what gets labeled the X1, Y1. What gets labeled second? That's the X2, Y2. Okay? Then substitute our values in. We're going to get negative 4 plus negative 1. Cut it in half. 
we're going to get negative 3 plus negative 1, cut it in half, and this becomes our midpoint. So this is negative 5 divided by 2. This is negative 4 divided by 2. Ooh. Midpoint. And think about it as losing $4, then you lose another dollar. You didn't gain $5, you lost $5. Losing $3, losing another dollar, you gain, you lost a total of $4. Now, this one is a little tricky because I can't cut five equally and make it a whole number. You're gonna get a decimal and that's okay. Decimals are welcome friends too. And then four divided by two is just gonna be two. And if you look, remember, we go back two and a half and then go down two. That's kind of where we put that midpoint to begin with, even though we didn't know what that answer was. All right. On to the last one over here is we're gonna talk about angles. And we start talking about angles Got to shrink it up a little bit for the phones. Sorry. Um, and it says I can identify, describe, name, and measure angles. So we're really kind of focused on this angle idea. First off, it says name the vertex and the two sides of an angle. Cowboy, welcome. And name the angle in four ways. So here is my vertex. The vertex is the middle point in the angle where the two rays go out, span out from. Remember we tell the ray was an initial point with a direction and they have, the two rays have the same initial point. That's what creates the angle. That's kind of why they call it an angle instead of double ray or something. Um, so when we do this, we are looking at this initial point, which is what we call the vertex. Um, and it spans out in this direction and also in that direction. So we can say that the vertex is point B and then the sides are BA, which is a ray, and BC, which is a ray. And that's how we would label um, the vertex and the sides of the angle. Uh, emoji, welcome, glad you're here. All right, now we want to name the angle in four ways. So we have to come up with four different ways to name this angle. Well, the first way we can do it is march yourself around the angle. And the vertex is always going to be in the middle. So that B value is always going to be in the middle. So start at one side, and we're going to start at A to B to C. And if I do that, that creates that angle. Same idea, put the vertex in the middle, but let's start at the other side. We could also call this C to B to A. Oops, A, sorry. I make mistakes all the time in class too, it happens. It's a good thing. All right, now you can see here, there are multiple angles coming in, multiple angles coming in. We could talk about all these different types of angles. However, in the one that we're working on, there is only one angle here. So if there's only one angle, there's not multiple angles coming out of this, we can actually call this just angle B. We can call it by its vertex because it's only one angle. Now, I cannot call this angle O because are we talking about FOE? Are we talking about EOD? We could be talking about FOA. You know, there's so many angles that come off of that O that we can't just label it an angle O. That doesn't mean anything to anyone. But if I just talk about angle B here, I know what angle I'm talking about because there's only one angle at B. And in that same idea, what number is inside? We could call that angle 2 as well. All right. Next question. EOA. E to O to A. And here, we want to start right down here. And you can see it goes up in increments, like here's a 10 degree, 
here's a 20 degree, here's a 30 degree. We start turning this dial until we get to this blue mark. And if we started over here, we want to use the bottom numbers. If we start over here, we want to use the top numbers because this would be angle zero. And then we would go up 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees. Okay. Um, so for this one, Medai, welcome. Um, for this one, we want to use the inside numbers. And the inside numbers will rotate all the way to 120 degrees. And doesn't that look like a 120 degree angle? So that's what gives us our 120 degree angle. Find and name the angle that measures 50 degrees. Oh man. So, using that same idea and logic, if we were, Patsy, welcome. If we were to start here and draw this angle, that's only a 40 degree angle because we do 10, 20, 30, 40. And then we could keep going and then we get to 60. So the 50 degree angle is not on that side. And I'm not saying it's on the other side either. It might be a combination of going from 30 to 80. That could be a 50 degree angle. Or uh, 50 to 100, that would be a 50 degree angle. But if we look at this right here, we start at zero. And remember, zero is at the bottom. And we go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 does go through. So we could actually use this. Now, when we write an angle, though, we want to start at one side, go through the vertex, and get to the other side. So I could call this AOC. Or I actually could call it COA as well. I could start here, go through there. Because it doesn't matter where you start. All they're talking about is the swing of this angle. And the swing of this angle is 50 degrees. I could swing it this way 50, or I could come back 50. It's still a 50 degree angle either way you swing it. Um, one might comment about going positive versus negative. I don't want to get that deep, especially with my kids. Uh, we just want to label that it's a 50 degree angle. All right, I don't want to get confused with the next one. What type of angle is FOA? So let's start, find F, go to O, and then go to A. So this is going to be what classifying our angle. So what kind of angle is that? If we start here at zero, we scream all the way to 140 degrees and anything over 90 is what we call an obtuse angle okay now if i wanted to sketch a right angle i want to make sure that i've got a i got my vertex b and i've got my third point c but what makes a right angle special is a right angle is equal to 90 degrees and is this a right angle? I don't know. Welcome, user. Um, but we can guarantee it is by doing one little thing. And that one little thing is putting a box in the corner. Anytime you see that box, that represents 90 degrees. Okay. Um, and angle one. So I might put a one here just to label it as angle one. Cookie equals thumbs up, Cookie Monster. All right, welcome. Appreciate you stopping by. All right, uh, angle two is an acute angle. So I want to make sure that inside my angle is a two, but what makes it acute? That acute means that it is smaller than 90 degrees. So I would put B here and put C here. And I put A here. And the reason I know it's going to be less than 90 degrees is because my 90 degree has to make that box. So I know that that angle is definitely going to be smaller than 90 degrees. So I can claim that as an acute angle. You could give it a measure if you wanted and show that it's like 30 degrees, 50 degrees, 60, 70, 89 even though it doesn't look that way, you can say any number between 
0 and 90, but it can't be equal to 0 and it can't be equal to 90. So you just have to stay in between those. And you'll be good to go. All right. I think that covers the four that I set up uh, for today. I'm going to continue on tomorrow and we're going to do some angle addition postulates, uh, inductive and deductive reasoning. We'll talk about some of the mathematical steps that we need. Hey, Malachi. Uh, some how we write statements and reasons, doing kind of proof stuff. We didn't do transformation. I didn't. I, we didn't have time to teach transformation. So um, we. I'll touch on it, but I'm not expecting my students to know. I'm just going to teach it, record it, and if they want to go through it, they can. They might see these on the final. I told them it wouldn't count against them. So uh, identify and describe symmetries. We we're going to talk about all these things, but we didn't get to that kind of stuff in class. We did talk about vertical, supplementary, complementary. Um, we talked about vertical angles. We talked about the linear pair postulate. What's a straight? What's the measure of a straight line? We talked about the four horsemen. Um, for those that are not familiar with it, we talked about four different shapes. There's an F shape, which is corresponding. There's a Z shape, which is alternate interiors. There's a U shape, which either they call consecutive interiors or same side interiors, depending on what textbook you're using. And then you have alternate exteriors, and I call those the butterfly wings, because I don't know, I'm weird. Um, and so we'll go through that. Next, we have more of the, you know, justifications with the parallel lines cut by transversal. Perpendicular lines, so once in that 90 degree stuff. Uh, triangle sum theorem, exterior angle theorem, we did that. Finding the measure of all these. Mm -mm. Triangle inequalities, does it make a triangle? When we talk about the sides, finding the perimeter and area, volume, surface area, all that good stuff. And that's going to finish it off for us. So I will make a couple more videos, but today we're just going to get through the first 14 problems. I, I told my kids, uh, hey, Reed, I told my students, like, take it in little chunks. If you can do 10 problems a day um, before at next week, Wednesday, they start final exam. So if you just did 10 problems a day, you would definitely get this done even before the final exam date even starts so that's kind of going to be our goal is just to work through this and we actually got through 14 today but we had 54 53 problems so it's okay so continue that work i apologize it wasn't on monday man i i don't know i've got a hacker on my computer and i can't for some reason tiktok live likes to do all these updates and every time the hacker gets in my system. I can't delete TikTok Live to reinstall it. I had to like literally reboot my entire computer. So one of these days I'm going to go into cybersecurity and take care of them. But uh, one thing at a time. So thank you for stopping by. I will be on again tomorrow if you want to join, especially for people that take geometry and are trying to get ready for their final exams. Um, feel free to stop by tomorrow as well. Keep the uh, alerts on. And for everyone else, thank you for coming. All right. Have a great night.